Now that we've made the urine, we've filtered the blood, reabsorbed the good stuff, secreted the bad stuff, we now need to get rid of this urine, so we need to look at urine transport, storage, elimination. So first, what does urine look like? Well, its appearance, it is almost colorless to a deep amber, depending on how much water is in there. The yellow color is due to urochrome, and that's from the breakdown of hemoglobin and the bilirubin that forms, it turns in, and then is converted into urochrome, causing that yellowish color. The odor is actually odorless. It's when the ur urine gets stagnant and sits uh, with for a while, and bacteria then allow it to degrade the urea and to form ammonia, and that's when the urine actually starts smelling. The pH is a huge range, all the way from 4.5 to 8.2 usually it's 6.0 and that range is because we're using remember we're using the kidneys to regulate the pH of our blood so when our blood pH gets too low we'll secrete more hydrogen ions and that will make the blood pH or excuse me the urine pH um, low the chemical composition is mostly water as you can see and then there's a few other of the solutes including um, sodium, potassium, chlorine, and the nitrogenous wastes like creatinine uh, that comes from muscle metabolism, um, uric acid that's from breakdown of nucleic acids, and then urea, which is the result of breaking down uh, proteins into amino acids and removing the NH2 um, to form ammonia, and then the liver ends up converting that ammonia into urea. Volume-wise, the normal volume of urine is one to two liters a day. If someone is peeing more than that, that's referred to as polyurea. Oligurea is when the volume of urine is less than 500 mils. And anuria, which is basically you're not peeing at all, um, is when it's less than 100 mils. Diuretics are used to end up affecting um, urine output and therefore blood pressure. Um, we see an increase in urine output, of course, when we use diuretics, and that in, ends up lowering blood volume and therefore blood pressure. And so we'll see that used for patients that are hypertensive or have congestive heart failure. There are different types of diuretics. Um, some of them are called osmotic diuretics. These could be simple substances like glucose could be considered di osmotic diuretic because it's, it's a substance that um, is not reabsorbed and therefore carries the water out with it. Think of the, the filtrate having a high number of solutes like glucose in it. That makes it more hypertonic and that's going to keep water with it or pull water in with it. And then you end up having a higher volume of urine. Alcohol works as a diuretic um, because it inhibits the release of um, ADH. Lasix is one of the prescribed diuretics that's used. Um, it, it causes the inhibition of sodium potassium chloride symporters, and that means you're not reabsorbing all of those ions. So that means more ions, more solutes in the um, filtrate and therefore water stays with those. Same thing with thiazide, just um, affecting another symporter. Again, keeping the solute concentration in the filtrate high so that way water stays there. It's hypertonic water, it's going to be pulled towards a hypertonic solution. So now that we've got the urine made, it's going to be leaving the kidneys, entering the ureter, so all the way from the renal pelvis passes dorsal to the bladder and enters the bladder from below on the bottom side of the bladder. Um, so that's length of about 25 centimeters. It contains three layers. The outside layer is called the adventitia. It's connective tissue for protection. Muscularis layer is two layers of smooth muscle so that this muscle, when it's stretched because of urine coming in, um, would cause it to contract and therefore form peristaltic waves to move the urine down through the ureters. So in other words, the ureters aren't simply an empty tube waiting for gravity to shove the, the uh, urine along or push the urine along. We actually need some peristaltic waves to move that urine. 
The mucosa is the inside layer. It's made of transitional epithelium. This is epithelium that actually changes its shape from a more cuboidal cell to a more squamous cell. And that just allows for a little bit more stretch in, in increasing the size of the lumen of that ureter. The lumen is very narrow so that it's easily obstructed even though you have that transitional epithelium that allows it to get bigger. Um, kidney stones can often get lodged in the ureters and then prevent urine from exiting those kidneys and causing a great deal of pain. The urinary bladder is located at the pelvis. Um, it is considered to be retroperitoneal, so it's behind the peritoneum. So just at the top portion of the outside layer of the bladder is the parietal peritoneum. The rest of the layer is a um, fibrous adventitia, thick connective tissue outline in it. You can see here we've got another layer of the bladder includes what's called the detrusor muscles, which are three layers of smooth muscle to contract and, and then um, push the urine out into the urethra. Um, and then the inside layer is a mucosa of transitional epithelium again, allowing that distension or stretching. Also can, inside there to allow for more stretching and, and the bladder to get larger are folds. You can see those, those are called rugae. The bottom of the uh, bladder consists of a triangular region. Here's the two openings of the, of the ureters and then the opening into the urethra forms this trigone or tri triangle shape. Um, as I mentioned before, the ureters come in and actually enter down here in the bottom in kind of a tangent line. That creates a little bit of a flap. And so that when the urine, when the bladder constricts and to push the urine out, that flap closes like a valve and prevents urine from backing up into the ureters. So a lot of these things on this page we've discussed, talked already, like the parietal peritoneum and the fibrous adventitia on the outside layer, the muscularis or detrusor muscles, the mucosa inside, the trigone, the rugae. Um, the only other thing is the capacity, and that's when it's moderately full and you'll get signals to empty it. It's about 500 mils. Maximum you're going to fill that bladder is about 800 mils. Once the um, urine leaves the bladder, it's going to enter in the last portion, and that's the urethra. Now for a female, the urethra is very short, only 3 to 4 centimeters long. It's marked at the beginning and the end by what are called your urethral sphincter muscles. There's an internal one that's involuntary and made of smooth muscle. And there's an external urethral sphincter that's skeletal muscle and voluntary. The male urethra, of course, is much longer. It extends about 18 centimeters. It still has the internal and external urethral sphincters, the involuntary and voluntary control to control when we urinate. Um, but the urethra has actually three regions to it. We've got this prostatic urethra, the portion of the urethra passing th right through the middle of the prostate gland. Then there's the membranous urethra that passes through the pelvic uh, cavity. And then finally the spongy urethra, the length of the penis. To void urine, it's called micturition. Basically, you get 200 mils of urine in the bladder. That's going to cause stretch receptors to send signals to the spinal cord. And in response, parasympathetic reflexes um, will be sent down to the bladder to get it to contract those detrusor muscles. Both the internal and external urethral sphincters will open and therefore you urinate. Now, this is the type of reflex we see in infants. Um, they don't have any voluntary control over their external urethral sphincter, and so um, they just pee into their diapers. The, once they become potty trained, then the micturition center of the pons receives stretch signals from the bladder, and they integrate their response with the um, involuntary response of the um, muscles, and it sends signals to stimulate the detrusors and open the internal urethral sphincter, but to keep the external urethral sphincter closed until we wish to go to the bathroom and urinate. And as long as we have that control, 
of that external ure urethral sphincter, we can control um, when we urinate. Of course, that signal becomes overridden if the bladder becomes too full and we simply can't hold it any longer. Um, incontinence is the inability to control urination voluntarily. And so for um, some women after childbirth, they have what's called stress incontinence. That birthing process um, destroys or partially destroys the external uh, sphincter muscles and therefore they have less control over urination. Older individuals may lose muscle tone and therefore become incontinent. So that ends our look at the urinary system and um, we'll look at the next video lecture series will be on acid base balance which will tie in a lot of both urinary and respiratory systems.